السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ سو ٹوڈے ان شاء اللہ ویر کین ہیو اے فیرلی لانگ کلاس ان شاء اللہ مائی ایم از ٹو کمپلیٹ سیرا بائی دی اینڈ آف دس منتھ ان شاء اللہ بیکاز ان دا منتھ آف رمضان وی وانٹ ٹو لائٹن دا برڈن فرام یو رائٹ اینڈ اٹس بیٹر اف وی کمپلیٹ سیرا بفور رمضان سو دیٹ ان رمضان یو ڈونٹ ہیو اینی ایکسٹرا سبجیکٹس رائٹ اینڈ اف وی گیو اے بگ گیپ ان یو نو ود دا منتھ آف رمضان دین that's not much fun meaning if, if you're in the flow of studying sira and then a whole gap of one and a half month or so i think that's a little too much would you agree with me okay so you're in it with me inshallah nahmaduhu wa nusalli ala rasulihi alkareem amma ba'd fa'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem bismillahi arrahmanir rahim rabb ishrah li sadri wa yassir li amri wahlul 'uqdatam min lisani yafqahu qawli So in our previous class, we ended with the expulsion of the second Jewish tribe from Medina. Which tribe was that? The Banu Nadir. Now, after the expulsion of the Banu Nadir from Medina, and by the way, which month was that in? The expulsion of Banu Nadir. Hmm? In which year? Fourth year after Hijrah. And some say it happened in Rabiul Awal. Some say it happened in Shawwal. There is difference of opinion. But for sure, it happened in the fourth year after Hijrah. Now, if you go back to the Battle of Uhud, remember that Abu Sufyan, when he was leaving, he came to the mountain where the Muslims were. right? And he called out to ask if the Prophet ﷺ was alive, if Abu Bakr was alive, if Umar anhu was alive. And a whole conversation took place between him and Umar anhu. So at the end of his conversation, he also said that we will meet again at Badr next year. So he said that we will meet at Badr. Why Badr? Because that is where the Muslims had defeated them. So Abu Sufyan is basically saying we'll meet at Badr so that we can defeat you now. Hmm? So the Prophet ﷺ told the Muslims to say, yes, it is an appointment for both of us. So now after one year, from Badr, in the month of Sha'ban, fourth year after Hijrah, the Prophet ﷺ made his way to Badr. All right? And with him were 1,500 companions. So at Uhud, how many companions were there? 700, right? Because 300 munafiqun, they left. And now at this time, how many companions went with him? 1,500. Now the Prophet ﷺ reached Badr and he remained there for eight days, waiting for Abu Sufyan, for the people of Makkah to arrive. But they did not show up. The fact is that the Makkans did leave Makkah, all right? They prepared an army, they got ready, they were making their way to Badr with 2,000 warriors under Abu Sufyan. But what happened, as soon as they got out of Makkah and they reached the spring of Majanna, all right? Here, Abu Sufyan, he said to his companions that war should be at a time when there is greenery, when there is food, your animals can graze, and you also have milk to drink. In other words, you've had good food, you have strength, you have the energy to fight. But since this year has been a year of drought, there is lack of water, lack of food, we don't really have much strength, so I'm going back. And it's up to you. If you want to come back with me, come back with me. And if you want to go fight, go fight. Now imagine if the leader is saying, I'm going back, who's going to go forward? Nobody's going to. So what happened? Everybody went back to Makkah. And the Prophet ﷺ with the Muslims, 1500 Muslims, he waited at Badr for eight days. The Makkans did not show up. So what happened? It is said that again, the passing caravans, The Muslims, they traded with them and they made profit. And alhamdulillah, they returned home safe and successful. Now, this incident, it established the strength and determination of the Muslims, right? Because it made it clear to everybody that even though Muslims suffered a huge loss at the Battle of Uhud, they are true to their word. They're committed. And their numbers just keep growing. They just keep increasing. And now the Makkans are going back All right, even though they're greater in number, but they lack that determination, that strength. And the Muslims, they have that strength and determination. So everyone learned this in, in Arabia, that Muslims are not going to accept defeat. Even if they suffer, they will get up again. And this teaches us a very big lesson, a very beautiful lesson, that even though we have suffered loss and pain in the past, that is the past. We have to worry about now. What can I do right now? What is within my capacity right now? Because sometimes we remain stuck in our past. 
that just because I lost an argument with this individual or I took this exam and I never passed, I don't think I can do this again. I don't think I can try again. But look at the determination of the Muslims. They suffered a huge loss at Uhud and now, true to their word, they're making their way to Badr. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected them. Now soon after this, what happened in the month of Sharban, four year after Hijrah was Badr the second. Alright? And in this time, the Prophet ﷺ also learned that the Ghatafan were preparing to fight the Muslims. Alright? Who were the Ghatafan? Ghatafan tribe was in the north of Arabia. So you're looking at, remember the map that I showed you earlier? The Najd in the middle, Hijaz on the left. Alright? And in the north is where the Ghatafan used to live. Alright? And the Ghatafan tribe was, was very different. It was a huge tribe, and they were also very different. They weren't very civilized. They would fight a lot. Suffice to say, they weren't very civilized. So anyway, the Prophet ﷺ, when he learned about the Ghatafan preparing to attack Medina, he gathered together 700 Sahaba. All right? And the plan was to march all the way to Ghatafan and basically cast terror into the hearts of the people of Ghatafan. So they don't even dare come towards Medina. Because if the Muslims are marching all the way to Ghatafan, what message are they giving to Ghatafan? We're ready to fight you. Right? We're ready to fight you. So what happened? When the Muslims reached Ghatafan, they camped outside, all right? Obviously, before their population. And when the Ghatafan learned about the Muslims approaching, they fled. All right? They fled and they, and they took shelter in mountains. So the Prophet ﷺ, he remained there in that camp for several days and then eventually the Muslims they returned back to Medina alright so there was no battle was there a battle? there was no battle the objective was basically to cast terror into the hearts of who? of who? the Ghatafan alright now this expedition is known as Ghazwa Dhatur Riqat okay Ghazwa Dhatur Riqat now some say that this expedition took place after the battle of Ahzab. And some say that this took place before the battle of Ahzab. Now Ghazwa Dhatul Riqat as well as the following expedition which was Ghazwa Muraisir or Ghazwa Banu Mustaliq. All right? In some books you will find these incidents before Ahzab and in the book that you have you will find it after Ahzab. Alright? There is a difference of opinion amongst the scholars. Both, both sides are, are very strong. We're just gonna look at it as it happened before the battle of Ahzab. Now, Ghazwa Dhatul Riqat. Remember that there was no actual battle. But on the return journey to Medina, several things happened. First of all, we learned that Salatul Khawf was revealed. This is when Salatul Khawf was revealed. Now remember that Surah Al Nisa, when was it revealed? The battle of? Uhud, all right? Meaning it was revealed in the early part when the battles were going on. Because remember Surah An-Nisa deals with inheritance as well. So shuhada, and because of that reason, remember at Uhud 70 people died. Now if 70 people have died, they've left behind some property. How to distribute that? All right? And where is Salatul Khawf mentioned? In which surah? Surah An-Nisa. Right? So it is said that Salatul Khawf was revealed on the return journey from Ghazwa, Dhatul Riqat. Also we learned that while the Muslims had camped outside Ghatafan, what happened was that in the night time when the Muslims were camped outside Ghatafan, two Sahaba were appointed to guard the Muslim army. One was a Muhajir and the other was Ansari. And I'm sure you've heard of this incident. Now what happened with these two that the Ansari, he said to the Muhajir, you rest first. I'll watch. I'll be the watch guard. You take some sleep. So what happened? The muhajir and they said that it was Ammar bin Yasir, radiallahu anhu. He slept. He fell asleep and his companion, he stood up. He was watching. And then he said, I might as well pray. So he started his night prayer. And when he started his night prayer, what happened? One of the ghatafani saw him. And so he shot an arrow at him. He shot an arrow at him. The Ansari man, he just took the arrow out and he continued praying. And now what happened, the Ghatafani man kept shooting arrows at him one after the other and this Ansari man did not break his prayer until he felt he was going to faint. 
So what happened? Then he woke Ammar radiallahu anhu up. And Ammar, when he saw the state of his companion, that he's bleeding and he's almost fainting, he said, why didn't you wake me up sooner? He said, I wanted to complete my salah. I wanted to complete my salah, but I couldn't because of this, of all the arrows. Now, remember that there is a hadith in a silsilatul sahihah that tells us that three kinds of eyes will not even see the fire of hell. Imagine. They will not even see the fire of hell. Which ones are they? One is the eye that stays awake, guarding fi sabilillah. All right? Meaning the eyes of the person who is awake at night. All right? And what is he doing? Guarding. He's putting his life in danger. He's, he's sacrificing his sleep. He's staying awake in order to guard those who are fi sabilillah. So these eyes will not even see the fire of hell. Another is those eyes which are uh, reduced from seeing what is unlawful. You know, غَضُّ basal lowering the gaze. So those eyes which are lowered, reduced, all right? Why? In order to not see that which is unlawful. Because you know that the first glance is forgiven. Because that is unintentional. But if a person continues to look, then he is sinful. So if something comes in front of a person and he realizes this is wrong and he looks away immediately, doesn't even allow him himself one more second to look at that haram object, then those eyes also will not even see the fire of hell. And the third is that which cries genuinely from the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us amongst those. In a report in Sahih Bukhari, we learned that وَيُذْكَرُ عَنْ جَابِرٍ in the book of Wudu that أَنَّ النَّبِيَ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمْ كَانَ فِي غَزْوَةِ ذَاتِ الرِّقَاعِ فَرُمِيَ رَجُلٌ بِسَهْمٍ that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم was in the غزوة of ذات الرقاع and a man was struck with an arrow فَنَزَفَهُ الدَّمُ فَرَقَعُ وَسَجَدَ and his blood was flowing basically but the man continued his prayer he did his ruku' and his sujood wa mada fi salati and he continued in his prayer and imam bukhari mentions this to prove that if during your prayer you are bleeding all right from a wound then that does not nullify your prayer because this sahabi he continued to pray hmm? anyway one more incident happened that when the muslims were returning to medina it was hot and when they camped, everybody found, you know, some tree or some place where they could find shade and, and rest in. And everybody was so tired that immediately they fell asleep. Even the Prophet ﷺ was resting. Now what happened? Imagine the entire army is sleeping. Quiet, still. Now a Bedouin man happens to pass by. And when he sees the entire army is sleeping, he finds the tent of the Prophet ﷺ. Or rather, he finds where the Prophet ﷺ was resting under a tree. And he goes to the Prophet ﷺ, grabs his sword, and he says, and basically the Prophet ﷺ woke up at that time. All right? And this man, he said to the Prophet ﷺ, aren't you scared of me? And the Prophet ﷺ said, no. So calmly he said, no. Now, this frightened the man, that I thought everybody was sleeping. Who's here that I didn't see? Why are you saying that you're not afraid of me? Which guards do you have? Who's here that I do not see? So the man said, who will protect you from me? Meaning you have no guards, you have no defense right now. Who's going to save you from me? And the Prophet ﷺ said, Allah. So the man, he got so frightened at this, that literally the sword fell from his hand. And then the Prophet ﷺ took the sword and he said, now who will save you from me? So that man, he said to the Prophet ﷺ, be the better of the two who took the sword. Meaning, show mercy to me. So the Prophet ﷺ asked him, would you accept Islam? He said, no. However, I will not fight you. I promise that I will never fight you. So the Prophet ﷺ let him go. Now, as Muslims are drawing closer to Medina, the journey was long, because remember that Ghatafan are all the way up north. All right? The journey was long, and everybody was riding their camel or taking turns on their horses. And the Prophet ﷺ noticed that at the back of the army, was one person who was really far behind. So the Prophet ﷺ asked, who is that? And he found out that it was Jabir radiallahu anhu, Jabir ibn Abdullah. Now, there's a famous hadith of Jabir radiallahu anhu. If you open any book of hadith, 
as soon as you start learning about tahara, wudu, masjid, salah, you learn about the hadith of Jabir radiallahu anhu. And this is when this incident occurred. And there's so many beautiful lessons that we learn from this hadith. Especially we learn about the character of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, Jabir radiallahu anhu, he said that, this is a hadith from Bukhari, that I was with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in a ghazwa, and this was ghazwa that al and my camel was slow and exhausted. So the Prophet ﷺ came to me and said, Oh Jabir. I said, Yes. He said, What is the matter with you? Meaning, how come you're all the way at the back? And he also looked really worried. So Jabir anhu he said that my camel is slow and tired, so I am left behind all the way at the back. In another version, we learned that Jabir anhu he said that the Prophet ﷺ asked him, Why are you so sad? And so he explained that his father had died at the Battle of Uhud. And when was Uhud? Before this expedition, right? And this is the reason why many scholars say that Zatul Riqa happened before Ahzab. Alright? Because Jabir anhu, his father had died recently. Alright? And he said that my father died leaving behind a big loan. And I have seven sisters. And Jabir anhu at this time was very young. He was, you could say, a teenager. All right, And all his you know, worries and his grief, they were piling up on him. And on top of that, he was on an old, slow camel. So the Prophet ﷺ, he got down from his camel. He said, Bismillah, and he poked the camel of Jabir with his stick. And when he did that, then he told Jabir, okay, ride your camel now. Jabir said that I rode the camel and it became so fast that I had to hold it from going ahead of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Meaning it became one of the fastest camels. Now imagine, here the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam took notice of the fact that Jabir is all the way at the back. He's young, he's worried, he looks stressed out. Why is he like that? So he asks him about his problems and he helps him. And now the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is helping him find a solution. All right? To his worries. That, okay, the loan is something that you can't really take care of immediately. Likewise, your seven sisters, you can't exactly get them married all at the same time. Right? You can't take care of this immediately. But what you can do is, the Prophet ﷺ asked him, have you gotten married? And Jabir said, yes. Why is the Prophet ﷺ asking him, have you gotten married? Why? Isn't that a very personal matter? Why is the Prophet ﷺ asking him? Because with his question, basically he's suggesting to him, you should get married. Right? Why is he bringing his attention to this marriage? When he has a huge loan to take care of, and he has seven sisters, a huge responsibility. For many people in this position, marriage is the last thing to worry about. And the Prophet ﷺ is saying, begin solving your problems with, start with marriage. That if he were to get married, then she would help him with his sisters. Why else? That marriage, when a person gets married for the right reason, then he has uh, the haq that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should help him financially. Haq. He has the right that Allah should help him. So inshallah, increased blessings. A wife is a source of emotional support, comfort for a man. In the Quran we learn that وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنْ خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا Right? You find sukoon. وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمَةً There is love and mercy. So the Prophet ﷺ is helping him find a solution to his problems. How? By suggesting that first of all, Jabir should get married. Because that will bring him emotional support, comfort that he, that he needs at this time. He needs a companion. So what happened? Jabir anhu said that, yes, I did get married actually. And the Prophet ﷺ asked him, is she young or older? And Jabir said, I married an older woman, meaning not very young. So the Prophet ﷺ said, why didn't you marry a young woman? Because then she would play with you and you would play with him. Right? Meaning, you know, you would have fun. Right? A friend, a companion, he's basically cheering up Jabir anhu. So Jabir radiallahu anhu said that I have sisters that are young in age and I wanted to marry someone who could look after them, you know, comb their hair. And in another version we learned that he basically said that I didn't want another little girl to look after. He wanted someone who was responsible enough, mature enough. 
So the Prophet ﷺ agreed and he said that you have done right. Now, the Prophet ﷺ, he asked Jabir anhu, sell this camel to me. And Jabir, you know, his camel just got fixed. It's riding so well. And he says, no way. The Prophet ﷺ said, sell it to me. Jabir said, no, no, no. And again, when the Prophet ﷺ asked, Jabir understood that the Prophet ﷺ is not joking, he's serious. So he said, Ya Rasulullah, take it for free. I mean, how can I sell it to you? Take it for free. The Prophet ﷺ said, no, sell it to me. So Jabir said, how much will you buy it for? The Prophet ﷺ said, one dirham. He's joking with him. All right, because one dirham basically means nothing. Okay, for a camel, it's nothing. So Jabir ﷺ said, no way. The Prophet ﷺ said, okay, two dirham. Three that hum. No, no, no. So this conversation kept going on until the Prophet ﷺ offered 40 dirham and Jabir who said, okay, 40 dirham. And then Jabir who said, let me write it back to Medina. When we get to Medina, then inshallah I'll give you the camel and you give me the money. And the Prophet ﷺ said, okay. Now Jabir who he's on his camel. His camel is riding fast. The Prophet ﷺ reminded him of his wife. And now he's, you know, getting ahead of the army. You know, he's rushing to get home. And the Prophet ﷺ advised him that when you get to Medina, don't just go straight home. Don't go straight home. And you know, all of the ahadith about that when a person arrives in the middle of the night, first of all, he should not go in the middle of the night. And when he arrives, he should go to the masjid first so that the family can prepare. Right? The woman who has Messy hair can fix her hair, right? Meaning she can dress up that her husband has arrived. So this is when the Prophet ﷺ gave these instructions. Now what happened? The Prophet ﷺ, he reached Medina early, alright? And Jabir who reached Medina a little bit after him. Now what happened the following day, Jabir who he went to the masjid with his camel, and he said to the Prophet ﷺ, I have the camel for you. The Prophet ﷺ said, did you just come to the masjid? He said, yeah. So the Prophet ﷺ said, first go pray, and then we'll talk business. All right? So this is where we learn that when a person goes to the masjid, the first thing that he should do is pray to rakat. So Jabir who he went, he prayed to rakat, and then he came to the Prophet ﷺ and he said, here is your camel. And basically he went, okay, can I have the money? And the Prophet ﷺ told Bilal anhu to bring the money. And it was equal to one uqiyah of gold. So Bilal anhu he brought the money and the Prophet ﷺ gave him, gave Jabir anhu the money. And when he gave him the money, the Prophet ﷺ said, الثَّمَنُ وَالْجَمَلُ لَكَ The price and the camel are both for you. Both are for you. Now why did Rasulullah ﷺ do that to him? He wanted to gift him, right? He wanted to give him some money to help him out with his loan. But at the same time, he didn't want Jabir to feel like embarrassed, right? That he was being given charity by the Prophet ﷺ. So what happened? The Prophet ﷺ bought the camel from him, right? He gave him the price and then he gifted him the camel as well. He gifted him the camel. And this entire conversation that happened in the journey, the whole point of that was to relax Jabir, cheer him up, teach him how to bargain, because now there was a huge responsibility on his shoulders, right? So he needed to learn how to buy and sell, how, how to strike a good deal. So the Prophet ﷺ was training him in that direction. And the Prophet ﷺ also taught him here how he should find comfort in being with his wife, even though she may be very young. And the Prophet ﷺ also gave him a sadaqah over here, a financial gift. I mean, you see how the Prophet ﷺ, he was concerned about every companion of his, right? And we learned that how he married Hafsa radiallahu anha, Zainab radiallahu anha, Umm Salama, all three were who? Widows. And now he's taking care of young Jabir. He's advising him. And this really sh- you know, shows the character of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, in the month of Ramadan, so in the month of Sha'ban, according to some, this expedition took place. And now fast forward to the month of Ramadan. All right? In the month of Ramadan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed Fatima and Ali with a son. The first grandson of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And when he was born, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to Ali, Show me my son. Bring him to me, I want to see him. 
So Ali radiallahu anhu brought the baby to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and the Prophet asked him, what's his name? And Ali radiallahu anhu said, Harb. What does Harb mean? War. Why do you think he gave him that name? Huh? Okay, he was born during wartime, Medina every year, every few months there was war. Right? And Ali radiallahu anhu, he was a warrior himself. So you can see he wanted the same from his son. So the Prophet ﷺ said to him, No, he is Hassan. Beautiful. That is his name. And then the following year, 11 months later, when his next son was born, Ali radiallahu anhu just slightly changed the name Hassan into Hussein, and he named his younger son Hussein, which basically means little Hassan. Now, the next main incident was the Ghazwa of Muraysir or Ghazwa Banu Mustaliq. Both terms are used to refer to the same event. The tribe was Banu Mustaliq and the location was Muraysir. Alright, Muraysir basically was a pond. Not a lake because in the middle of the desert you don't have lakes, but a place where water would collect, rain water or something like that, it, it would collect and this area was known as Muraysir. So the tribe that lived here was known as Banu Mustaliq, right? And the area was called Muraysir. And this area was located between Mecca and Medina. So where is it? In the south of Medina, north of Mecca. Now the Banu Mustaliq, they were close allies of the people of Mecca. All right? And they were their allies since the time of Abdul Muttalib. They had made alliances with the people of Mecca with, uh, through Abdul Muttalib. So it's quite old, this alliance. All right. And the Banu Mustaliq, they were no ordinary tribe. All right. First of all, they had uh, alliances with the Quraysh, with the people of Mecca. And secondly, they had the idol Manat. Remember that the Mushrikeen, they had certain major idols, right? Lat, Uzza, Manat. And these are mentioned in the Quran in Surah Al-Najm. Alright? So the idol Manat, it was with the Banu Mustaliq. It was in Muraysir. Alright? So you can imagine that this was also a busy place. People would come in order to dedicate their, you know, in order to offer their sacrifices and all to this idol. And also, because they were close friends with the people of Mecca, the people of Mecca, you know, they found this Basically, safety zone, all right, closer to Medina. You understand? Because if they went out of Mecca, you know, on the trade route, the Muslims could come and fight them, all right? But because of the presence of Banu Mustaliq, they were safe until they reached the Banu Mustaliq. Beyond Banu Mustaliq, the area between Banu Mustaliq and Medina, that, that was the danger zone for the Mushrikeen of Mecca. All right? And also at the Battle of Uhud, Remember that the Banu Mustaliq had helped the Mushrikun. They had helped the Mushrikun. Many of their people participated in the Battle of Uhud. They financially helped the, the, the people of Mecca in the Battle of, of Uhud. And now the Banu Mustaliq were preparing to launch an offensive against the Muslims in Medina. Now when the Prophet ﷺ heard about this, you notice how so many people were planning to attack Medina? One after the other. And the Prophet ﷺ is so proactive, he finds out, right? And then when he confirms the news, he he's so proactive, he goes b- before the enemy can come. Either cast terror into their heart or fight them and, and, and break their power so they don't have the strength to come and fight the Muslims. Hmm? So here what happened, the Prophet ﷺ sent a particular companion by the name of Buraida radiallahu anhu to confirm the rumor. So Buraida radiallahu anhu, he went to the Banu Mustaliq pretending to be a Bedouin and he went and spoke to the chief and he said that, look, I have heard that you are planning to attack Medina. If you are, please let me come with you so that I can also have a share of the booty. All right? Because at that time, if anybody wanted to make quick money, what would they do? Join someone who was going to raid another tribe. All right? So when you raid another tribe, you take whatever you can. You catch two people, you get two slaves. You catch somebody's horse, whatever, you, you get a free horse. So you understand Buraida radiallahu anhu's trick? He said that I have heard that you are planning to attack Medina. If so, let me join you so that I can also get a share of booty. I need money. So the leader, he said, sure. 
What did that mean? That they are going to attack Medina. So Buraida radhiallahu anhu, he pretended to stay with them, all right, in the night. And as soon as night fell, he ran off to Medina. He told the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And the next morning, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam took seven hundred Muslims with him, and they went straight to Banu Mustaliq, and they attacked. And when they attacked, what happened? Because the people were not expecting it, all right, they were not prepared, and it was early morning. They were not prepared, and it is said that the men basically they fled, because it's easy for them to run away, right? So the men of the Banu Mustaliq they fled, even their leader. All right, who's left behind? Children, women, old, sick, or some you know some men they got left behind. And what else did they leave behind? All of their camels, their sheep, everything. So there were very few casualties. All right, but what happened? One thousand people were taken as captives. All right, and it is said that that there were over two thousand camels, five thousand sheep. Now all of this is brought back to Medina. So this was a massive victory for the Muslims with very minimal effort and hardly any fighting. Now. Very important events happened after this victory. First of all, we learned that the captives, the one thousand captives, they were divided amongst the people. All right, because remember that at that time the custom was that prisoners of war, what happens to them? There were no jails. All right, they didn't have such infrastructure where they could support people in. In in captivity, I mean, they barely had food themselves to eat. How could they provide three meals a day to? Uh, prisoners, all right. So remember that earlier, also at the Battle of Badr, when the captives were brought in, what was done with them? They were kept in the houses of the Muslims, right? Even the Prophet ﷺ had Suhail bin Amr as a captive, right? So, but this time, what was done? That the captives were distributed, and the custom at that time was that captive, basically, he's he's a slave, all right. Now this happened. The daughter of the chief, her name was Juwadia. She was a princess. She fell in the hands of a particular companion, Sabit radhiallahu anhu. But she said to him that, "Look, I'm a princess. I don't want to live as a slave. All right, let me buy my freedom from you." He said, "Sure, no problem." Because this is something that the Muslims are told in Surah An-Nur, we learn that if there is a slave who wishes to buy his freedom, فَكَاتِبُهُمْ right? Then make the kitaba with them, meaning make the contract with them. Let them buy their freedom, and وَأَتُوهُمْ مِنْ مَالِ اللَّهِ الَّذِي أَتَاكُمْ Give them from the wealth that Allah has given you. Meaning, the master is told you also financially help the slave buy his freedom. Meaning, wave off some of the some of the cost, all right? So some of the payment. And other Muslims are encouraged that you help the slave buy the freedom. So what happened? Sabit bin Abdullah and who he agreed. So Juwaria, she went straight to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam because he was the leader. So she went straight to him and she said that I want to buy my freedom. Please help me. Now what happened? Here the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam offered Juwaria something. Which completely changed the fate of the entire tribe of Banu Mustaliq. What happened? Because the Prophet ﷺ knew who Juwaria was. She was the princess, the daughter of the chief of Banu Mustaliq. Who are the Banu Mustaliq? Allies of Quraysh. They are wealthy. They have the idol manat. They have a very good reputation. They are well respected. Juwaria is no ordinary woman. So the Prophet ﷺ said, "How about?" You marry me, and your mahar will be your freedom. Meaning, I will pay for your freedom. All right, I will pay Thabit. Once you're free, you marry me. He gave her the choice. He didn't force it. Nothing. He gave her the choice. Juwaria said, "Sure," because she's a princess, right? Who's the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Qurayshi, and also a leader. So Juwaria thinks my father he's abandoned me. God knows if he's going to come or not. Where are my people? I don't know. They just left us. They just ran, leaving us all behind. So you can imagine how angry the women are with their men. This is pure betrayal, right? That you run off, leaving us behind. So she says, 
who knows if they're coming or not i have a i have a good offer he's the leader he's a noble man right and now she's in medina she's looking at how the muslims are she asks thabit if she can purchase her freedom thabit says for sure no problem right and she thinks it's a very good offer so she says sure now she has a home if she gets married she has a well respected position in medina if she gets married to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam all right so what happened the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam married her now when he married her her blood relatives are in the houses of the muslims as slaves so what happened some sahaba they said this is not right the in-laws of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam our slaves no way set them free so all of the banu mustaliq were set free all were set free because of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's marriage to juwayya radhiyallahu anha now what happened after a couple of days the men of banu mustaliq they realize our women our children are in medina you know this is not right we should go get them back because it's a huge disgrace for them it does it doesn't befit an arab man that his wife is taken as captive his daughter is taken as captive so after a few days the the chief al harith and his men they come to medina in order to talk to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam strike some deal with them to let the captives go to to let the people go but when he comes he sees everything is different here I mean our people are free what's going on and he goes to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam asking if he will let his daughter go juwaidia the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said ask her it's her choice if she wants to go with you go ahead so basically the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is giving juwaidia radhiyallahu anha the right to divorce if she wants what happened juwaidia juwaidia radhiyallahu anha she said no i'm staying here i'm not going anywhere So Harith he was so affected by this because now he's interacting with the Muslims he's interacting with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he's looking at his own daughter how happy she is over here she he was so affected by this he embraced Islam when he embraced Islam because he was the chief what happened to all the people of Banu Mustaliq they also embraced Islam when they embraced Islam The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam appointed Harith as the chief of his people again. All right. He was the chief again. All the people are free. All their wealth is returned to them. And they go home. They go home. Everything goes back to normal. What's the difference now? Before they were on shirk, now they are upon Islam. Before they were enemies of the Muslims, now they are friends with the muslims before they were allies of the quraysh now they're no longer allies of the quraysh how did this happen what was it that shifted the entire thing marriage to juwaidia radhiyallahu anha now we see the hikmah behind the marriages of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam because many many muslims even find it difficult to accept why did the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam marry so many women there was a reason there was a reason because with every marriage he helped the muslims every marriage was a cause of spreading strengthening islam there was hikmah behind that and you see juwaidia radhiyallahu anha he gave her the choice if you wish you marry me and later on when her father came if you wish you can go but both times what does she choose the same thing companionship with rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam now another thing happened when the muslims returned from banu mustaliq and what was that that the hypocrisy of the munafiqun was exposed it was revealed it became very very clear how it is said that a small fight broke out between an ansari youth and a muhajir youth a small fight an argument and the ansari boy he said ya ansar help me and the muhajir boy said ya muhajirun help me so you see what's happening over here they're calling their own people all right now when this happened the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he came and he basically discouraged the sahaba he said that this is this is something that that is foul that this is from the jahiliya leave this this is not good so immediately the ansar the muhajirun they they calmed down and they resolved the situation however abdullah bin ubay when he heard about this he was on the one hand very happy that finally the ansar had looked at themselves differently you know they they had 
separated themselves from the Muhajirun. He was happy with this division. And at the same time, he was very angry. Why was he angry? That the situation got resolved so quickly. Right? He wanted this conflict between the Muslims because he was not happy with everybody accepting the Prophet ﷺ. He was not happy with the Muhajirun coming into Medina. You know how some people have a problem with immigration? Right? Abdullah bin Ubay was that man in Medina who had a huge problem with immigration. He didn't want any outsiders in Medina. He said they're a financial burden on us. You know, they have taken our lands and they, we have shared our wealth with them. They're a big burden on us. We have to get rid of them. So when he learned of this incident, he thought, great, but why did this get resolved so quickly? So basically in his anger, he said certain things about the Prophet ﷺ, about the Muhajirun, which were very, very disrespectful and there's no need to repeat them over here. But anyway, one young companion, Zaid bin Alqam, he heard that conversation and he went to the Prophet ﷺ and informed him. That Ya Rasulullah, this is what Abdullah bin Ubay was saying about you. This is what he was saying about the Muhajirun. Now the Prophet ﷺ, he called Abdullah bin Ubay and he asked him, did you say this? Abdullah bin Ubay refused point blank. He said, no way. I didn't say this. He was lying and he began swearing oaths. By Allah, by Allah, I didn't say this. Hmm? And what happened? Zayd bin Arqam was really sad. Because the Prophet ﷺ accepted the word of Abdullah bin Ubay. So now who looked like a liar? Zayd bin Arqam. And he was a young child. All right. Now what happened? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed Surah Al-Munafiqoon at this occasion, on the return journey to Medina. Surah Al-Munafiqoon was revealed. إِذَا جَاءَكَ الْمُنَافِقُونَ قَالُوا نَشْهَدُ إِنَّكَ لَرَسُولُ اللَّهِ وَاللَّهُ يَعْلَمُ إِنَّكَ لَرَسُولُهُ وَاللَّهُ يَشْهَدُ إِنَّ الْمُنَافِقِينَ لَكَاذِبُونَ Allah bears witness that the hypocrites are liars. اتَّخَذُوا أَيْمَانَهُمْ جُنَّةً They have taken their oaths as a shield. Because Abdullah bin Ubay kept swearing oaths by Allah. By Allah, by Allah. You know, he kept swearing oaths again and again. So when a, when, when a person is swearing oaths in front of you, how are you meant to re- reject their word? You have to accept it, right? So these ayat, they exposed Abdullah bin Ubay. All right? Now, Abdullah bin Ubay got even more angry. Even more angry. That now Quran is being revealed against me, exposing me. So what happened? Abdullah bin Ubay, he said, that when we go to Medina, then we'll see what happens. The one who has more izzah will expel the one who has dhillah. The one with more honor will expel the one who is with less honor. Hmm? So basically he's saying, I am more honorable. When we go to Medina, I will make sure that I expel Muhammad ﷺ from Medina. This is basically what he was saying. And Allah revealed an ayah in Surah Al-Munafiqoon that يَقُولُونَ لَإِن رَجَعْنَا إِلَى الْمَدِينَةِ لَيُخْرِجَنَّ الْأَعَزُّ مِنْهَا الْأَذَلْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala quoted the exact statement of Abdullah bin Ubay. Hmm? Now what happened? Umar radiallahu anhu, he offered the Prophet ﷺ, allow me, allow me, just order me and I will take care of this. I'll finish him off. Because Abdullah bin Ubay, I mean, his hypocrisy was... Evident. If Allah is revealing ayat about what Abdullah bin Ubay is doing, what he's saying, there's no doubt about his hypocrisy. But Abdullah bin Ubay this whole time, he's pretending to be a Muslim. And you see, the interesting thing is that Abdullah bin Ubay went on this expedition. Why? Because the journey was short, victory was guaranteed. Booty was huge. This is why he went. And this is actually mentioned in the Quran. That if the journey is short... Victory is guaranteed, gains are more, then they will come along with you happily. But wherever there are risks, there are dangers, they come with excuses that we cannot come. So anyway, the Prophet ﷺ did not allow Umar radiallahu anhu that no, you don't do anything like that. But the son of Abdullah bin Ubay, his name was also Abdullah. All right? He went to the Prophet ﷺ and he said that if you would like my father to be executed, then let me do it. Because I don't think I can see another man walking around Medina who has killed my father. Basically what he's saying is that I'm afraid that this relationship of blood that I have with my father, that will cause me to become angry. 
but it's the right thing to do. My father should be punished because of what he has done. So if you are going to order anybody to assassinate him, order me so that I cannot take revenge from anybody. You understand? This is how sincere this sahabi was. And the Prophet ﷺ said to him, No, your duty is to be a good son and companion to him. So Abdullah returned and he basically went in the entrance of Medina where the army was coming in to Medina from. He went and stood there with his sword, uncovered, ready to strike. And when his father, Abdullah bin Ubayy, approached, he said, You cannot enter until the one with honor allows you to enter. So he did not let his father enter Medina. And Abdullah bin Ubayy had to wait until permission was sought from the Prophet ﷺ. He allowed Abdullah bin Ubayy and then Abdullah bin Ubayy entered Medina. Now this entire incident, what happened? It exposed the reality of Abdullah bin Ubayy. Up until this point, there were many Muslims who were with Abdullah bin Ubayy, who were influenced by him, who got affected by his words, who would listen to him. But when this incident happened, the reality of Abdullah bin Ubayy was exposed and so many of his supporters abandoned him. Many of the people who were influenced by Abdullah bin Ubayy, now what happened? They left him and they became sincere believers. So you see what happened? And this is the reason why the Prophet ﷺ did not allow that Abdullah bin Ubayy be killed. Because if he had him killed, then what would happen? The Ansar, his blood relatives would become angry. Right? They, they would become even more upset. So the Prophet ﷺ, he was so calm, and he let the things unfold themselves, and subhanAllah, khair did come about. Now one more thing that happened, that Abdullah bin Ubayy, you can imagine how angry he was from inside. What did he want to do? He wanted to take revenge, to get even with the Prophet ﷺ. So what happened when the Muslims reached Medina? Soon they saw that a companion by the name of Safwan radiallahu anhu, he is coming towards Medina. He's leading his camel. And on his camel is the wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Aisha radiallahu anha. Alright? Now when Abdullah bin Ubay saw them approaching, he said, something bad has happened here. So in other words, he's saying that this was a plan of Safwan and Aisha. Na'udhu Billah. They stayed behind deliberately. They did something wrong. They did something haram. And now they're coming into Medina, pretending that they got late. He's accusing Safwan and Aisha radiallahu anha of zina. And this is known as ifk, the lie. The lie. And in Surah An-Nur, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed several ayat about this incident. That in الَّذِينَ جَاءُوا بِالْإِفْكِ عُصْبَةٌ مِّنْكُمْ لَا تَحْسَبُهُ شَرٌ لَكُمْ بَلْ هُوَ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ Don't think it to be bad for you, it's actually good for you. Because much good came about from this. وَالَّذِي تَوَلَّا كِبْرَهُ لَهُ عَذَابٌ عَظِيمٌ That the one who took the greater share of it, for him is a great painful punishment. Alright? And who was that who took the greater share of this? Abdullah bin Ubay, because he started this. What happened was, <clears throat> this hadith is mentioned in great detail. Aisha radiallahu anha herself has reported this incident in which she says that whenever the Prophet ﷺ intended to go on any journey, he would cast lots between his wives. Right? To be fair with them. So what happened on this journey? Aisha radiallahu anha, it was her chance. So she went along with the Prophet ﷺ. But what happened? That she said when the Muslims were camped on the return journey, they had stopped. It was announced that we're going to leave pretty soon. So Aisha radiallahu anha, she said that I went to use the bathroom. And she said when she returned to her camel, she realized that her necklace was missing. She had lost her necklace. So she went looking for her necklace. All right. And when she came back, they were gone. Everybody was gone. So Aisha radiallahu anha said that realizing that they had left, she, she when, when she didn't see them in the distance, she just, stayed exactly where she was because she realized that eventually they will figure out that she's missing and they will come to look for her. So when they will come to look for her, they'll find her here. So she stayed there and she said, waiting, she fell asleep. Now Safan anhu, his job was to stay behind the Muslim army a day or so, all right, or a few hours at least, 
and you know uh, go the same route to make sure <clears throat> that in case something was left something was forgotten he would bring it all right so what happened when he came he saw somebody sleeping and he recognized Aisha radhiyallahu anha and he said inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un and Aisha radhiyallahu anha she said that is all i heard from him she got up he brought his camel she sat on the camel and she said the whole journey he didn't say a word to me the whole journey he didn't say even a single word she said when she got to medina she didn't know that she didn't know about what abdullah bin ubay had said all right and when she reached medina she fell ill and she was sick for an entire month and she said this whole month nobody ever told me what happened but the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam his he was distant his uh, behavior was different he was kind of quiet so aisha radhiyallahu anha she didn't know what to make of it and one night she went to use the bathroom with uh, a particular friend umm mistah and when they were coming umm mistah tripped over something and in her anger she said may mistah be ruined so she's basically cursing her son so aisha radhiyallahu anha looks at her surprised why are you cursing your son you know he participated at badr you know if you're angry at him for some reason realize the fact that he was at badr he's a muhajir so umm mistah said don't you know what's going on aisha said no i don't know what's going on so then she told aisha radhiyallahu anha about the lie the slander that abdullah bin ubay had started and that her son mistah was also one of the people who was saying that yes aisha had done something wrong it wasn't just mistah radhiyallahu anhu it was also hamna bint jahsh radhiyallahu anha the sister of zainab bin jahsh all right and it was also hassan bin thabit radhiyallahu anhu the poet of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam these three people they also sided with the slander all right meaning they said that yes this happened they accused aisha radhiyallahu anha of the wrong they basically felt you know they got affected by the propaganda of Abdullah bin Ubay and you know we think the sahaba were like superhuman beings and and perfect human beings they had imperfections also they made mistakes so when aisha radhiyallahu anha found out she said she wept and wept and wept and she asked the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to allow her to go to her parents house she didn't talk to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam about this she went to her parents house and asked her mother is this true and when her mother confirmed she said she wept the whole night it's like her tears would not stop and then she said that one woman from the ansar came and she wept with her and aisha wept and she's weeping both of them were crying together and then the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam came and he said to aisha that look if something wrong has been done then seek forgiveness from allah allah is forgiving and if you haven't done anything wrong then allah will you know reveal your innocence then you don't need to worry and aisha radhiyallahu anha she said to her mother say something her father say something no we can't say anything so aisha radhiyallahu anha she said that you have heard so much about this propaganda that if i were to say that i am innocent you're not going to believe me and if i were to say that i am guilty which i am not you would believe me so i am just going to say wallahu musta'an ala ma tasifun sabrun jamil beautiful patience wallahu musta'an ala ma tasifun and aisha radhiyallahu anha at this time was very young and she's quoting quran okay so what happened at that time the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam received revelation the ayat from surah an-nur about the incident of ifq were revealed the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said to aisha good news and your innocence has been revealed her mother said aisha thank the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam she said no i'm not thanking him i'm only thanking allah because he revealed my innocence now the three people the three sahaba who who participated in this ifq they were punished with the punishment of qadaf which is 80 lashes it's revealed in surah an-nur abdullah bin ubay was not punished because again he was a leader and if he was punished that, that would cause huge problems right and also the ulama say that the main reason why he was not punished was because he was not even guilty from inside he didn't even feel bad about what he had done and allah did not wish to purify him allah did not wish to purify him so his punishment in the hereafter will be worse it will be much greater so this this imagine this incident it went on for an entire month 
All right, this ifk is going on. Aisha radhiallahu anha did not know. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam loved Aisha radhiallahu anha. And Aisha radhiallahu anha, when she was talking to her mother, her mother said that Ya Aish, every woman who is loved by her husband, people are envious of her. So you know that your husband loves you, right? So this is just a trick that people have come up with to hurt you. And we learned that at this time, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam asked some of the companions that. What should I do? What do you think? And some, like for example, it is said that Ali radhiallahu anhu. This is reported that he indirectly suggested to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that just divorce Aisha, because I mean Allah has given you so many other wives, right? If she's innocent, no problem. If she's guilty, you're free of her. Now Aisha radhiallahu anhu, when she learned about this, she was so angry with Ali radhiallahu anhu that for the rest of her life, whenever she would have to mention anything about Ali radhiallahu anhu, she would not even take his name. You know, there's so many ahadith in which we learn that Aisha radhiallahu anhu is saying that a man came. Okay, a man came. Now who is that man who's coming into the house of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam? Who could it be? It was Ali radhiallahu anhu. But Aisha radhiallahu anhu would not even mention his name. And this is normal. It's natural. Another companion, he said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam that we don't know, I mean... Uh, we only know good about Aisha. She's the daughter of Abu Bakr, right? And if you need to know about her, ask people who are closest to her. So they called Barira, who was a freed slave of Aisha radhiallahu anha, and she used to live with Aisha radhiallahu anha. And when she when she was asked, "What do you know about Aisha?" She's so nervous because the Prophet sallallahu is interrogating her. What do you know about Aisha? Is there any anything that would give you, you know, a warning sign that perhaps Aisha would do something like that? And Barira, all that she can come up with is um, she sometimes forgets to knead the dough, and she leaves it outside, and she falls asleep, and a goat comes and eats it. This is the only sin of Aisha that she can remember. This is how beautiful the character of Aisha radhiallahu anha was. But imagine a whole month, a whole month goes by like this. No revelation came regarding this incident. And there's beautiful ayat regarding this in Surah An-Nur, guiding the Muslim community regarding these matters. That if you don't know about something, if you haven't seen it, don't speak about it. Because when you're speaking about it, then you're spreading the slander. When you're spreading the slander, you're responsible for it. And this was especially painful for the Prophet ﷺ. Right? I mean, if you think about it, this incident could have happened with any other woman. Any other husband wife, right? But Allah decreed that it happened with who? The Prophet ﷺ. It happened with his family. And then it could have happened with Sauda radiallahu anha, Umm Salama. But Allah decreed that it happened with Aisha radiallahu anha. This was a huge test for the Prophet ﷺ. But with this test, there were also great darajat. All right, everybody stand up, please. Now, I want you to discuss with the person standing next to you two lessons that you have learned from this incident, the incident of Ifk. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Okay, so the two lessons we learned are, first was um, that you're not supposed to speak about things that you don't know in confirmation, or even if you do know it, it's best to just like conceal, ha- conceal it rather salt. than just saying it. Yeah. And then... When she, I think, tripped on the rock and she cursed um, her son, we said that you should, it's better to remain quiet when you're angry because when you're angry, you're going to say things you're going to regret later. So um, you should really think about what you're doing and not curse other people. <laughs> and remember when the Prophet ﷺ was in the Battle of Uhud and one companion, his uh, fingers got cut off and he said, mm-hmm. and the Prophet ﷺ said, you should have said, Bismillah. Right? So whether we trip or we get a cut or anything, instead of, Complaining and whining and cursing. Remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anything else quickly? Assalamu alaikum. alaikum. Um, SubhanAllah, the whole time, everything is decreed so perfectly. All of this happened because she went to the washroom and she forgot her necklace. And I was thinking, I'm reflecting a couple of weeks ago about everything in our life that happens, it was just little decisions that we made that just came together and everything was planned by Allah perfectly. No about it. She did not rant and rave and say, why are you all accusing me when I am innocent? She just said, can I please go to my parents' home? I mean, and she waited. She did not even ask the Prophet ﷺ about this. When he came home, she said, please allow me to go to my parents' house. And when she went to her parents, 
she asked her mother, is this true? And when her mother confirmed, then she cried. Um, one thing I learned is that um, how some people, they think that uh, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi was used to know the ghaib, that he didn't know, yes. that he was quiet, and he was waiting Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala to reveal ayahs or wahi, because a lot of people, you know, they think that he was used to know the ghaib. Yes. So this is what I Yes, learned. it's a clear uh, proof that he did not know no. the unseen. Go ahead. Learn that the power of words, you know, Saying something that could just be a passing comment can impact someone's life and yes. can really have a devastating impact on their emotional well-being and even the relationship between the mm-hmm. husband and wife. So we have to just take every single word seriously. Yes. And also the what you said, how um, every woman who's loved by her husband is envied by other women. I never knew that. So subhanAllah, <laughs> it's something to think about. Aisha the lower and his mother said that to her. She's basically comforting her. For someone who has, uh, this story touches me a lot because I, I feel myself crying because when you go through a situation, when I heard this, it just, something like similar to this happened where I was accused of something that I didn't do. And there's not eyes that time. You gotta like, at that time, there's no revelation. So I was like, Subhanallah, who's gonna save me? And it was making me cry because I was going through this for five months. And actually the person that did this to me, she found herself guilty and then she went around and told everybody that she told the falsehood to that she was wrong. So Allah found out saved me in that way. So yes. it's like Allah will help you. You just have to be patient. Yes. You have to be patient. Look at the words of Aisha. Sabrun Jameel. Wallahu musta'an ala ma tasifun. We don't think about the severity of uh, this type of action. We don't put ourselves in the other person's shoes when this type of uh, talk goes on. Mm-hmm. That this is something very serious. Accusing yeah. someone of having an affair or relationship with a non-mahram, this is serious. And, uh, you know, this is such a big sin that the punishment for it is 80 lashes. And not not only that, like uh, nowadays, you know, we hear, we hear a lot of things, you know, we hear, you know, things that we're not sure of, like so-and-so is having a relationship with someone else, or, you know, this is what is going on. We don't know. Uh, what's the truth? But you know, we spread it. We tend to spread it, and it's a sin. It's a sin, and if you think, it's a criminal offense. Yeah. I was thinking um, the importance. It shows the importance to maintain self-respect when you're innocent, and even if the greatest person thinks negatively of you, as long as Allah knows well of you, then you shouldn't feel bad about yourself. Jazakumullah khairan. Okay. The next main event was the Battle of. Ahzab. Now remember that these expeditions that we learned about, Muraisir and Dhatul Riqat, there's difference of opinion. Some say it happened before Ahzab, some say it happened after Ahzab. Basically, the, the thing is that some ulama, they thought that the battle of Ahzab was fought in the fourth year of Hijrah. Imam Bukhari was of that opinion. That the battle of Ahzab was fought in the fourth year of Hijrah. And the evidence that Imam Bukhari gives in Sahih Bukhari is uh, the narration of Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu who said that at the battle of Uhud he was 14, so he was not allowed to participate. But at the battle of Ahzab he was 15, so he was allowed to participate. So they say only one year was between Uhud and Ahzab. So they said Ahzab was in fourth year. However, this narration alone, I mean, it, it's also possible that what Ibn Umar meant was that I was past 15. Hmm? when Ahzab happened. Because 15 was the requirement, right? The minimal age that a person could be of. So uh, perhaps he meant that I was, you know, past 15 when Ahzab happened and I could participate in that. Or it's also possible that at the time of Battle of Uhud, he had just turned 14. All right? And at the Battle of Ahzab, he was at the end of 15. So like that, there are two years. Because there are many narrations on the other hand that show that for example, the narration of Jabir radiallahu anhu, that that riqat happened after Uhud, right? Because of the fact that he was worried about the loan and everything at his father's death. So anyway, the, the there some ulama say that the Battle of Ahzab happened in the fifth year of Hijrah, in the month of Shawwal. Now remember that the Jewish tribe that was expelled from Medina, which tribe was that? First of all, Banu Qaynuqar and then Banu Nadir. Now the Banu Nadir who had, ex- who had been expelled from Medina, they went to Khaybar. All right? But remember that they had left behind in Medina, what? Their houses. 
even though they took their window frames and door frames and everything with them, but still they had left behind their houses. And it was not just the houses, it was their lands. They had orchards and orchards of date palm gardens. And they wanted it back. And they wanted revenge. But as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran in Surah Ali Imran, that ضُرِبَتْ عَلَيْهِمُ الذِّلَّةُ أَيْنَمَا ثُقِفُوا إِلَّا بِحَبْلِ مِنَ اللَّهِ وَحَبْلِ مِنَ النَّاسِ So they needed حَبْلِ مِنَ النَّاسِ They needed the rope of people to get strength in order to take revenge. So who did they go to? They went to the Quraysh. They sent an official delegation of their elders to Mecca and they asked the Quraysh to join hands with them and fight the Muslims. On top of this, they also promised a hefty financial contribution. They said, you know what, we'll sponsor most of it. You just bring your men. We want to do this together. We need your support in this. Now the Quraysh, on the other hand, they had not had any uh, you know, victory over the Muslims so far. But there was a defeat. Uhud, it brought no solution. Right? It, there was no clear victory on, on either side. And then the the second Badr, the Quraysh, they did not have the confidence to go forth. Right? They, they returned without fighting. So the offer of Banu Nadir looked very good to them. So immediately the Quraysh were willing. They said, yes, we, w- we are in this with you. Now what happened? The next step that the Banu Nadir took was that they sent a delegation to Ghatafan. Remember Ghatafan, the barbaric tribe? Right, the not very civilized people, many men, warriors, ready to fight, greedy for wealth, not scared of bloodshed. They went to Ghatafan, and also remember that Ghatafan was the largest tribe up north. All right, so they went to Ghatafan, but Ghatafan they were not interested because they had no problem with the Muslims so far. I mean, the expedition of Zatul Riqat happened, but they had learned their lesson: don't mess with the Muslims. They will come all the way here. To fight us. And remember the Muslims camped there for several days, 700 Muslims, and then the Prophet ﷺ went back without any fight. The point was to cast terror into the hearts of Ghatafan. Right? So Ghatafan had learned their lesson. Don't mess with the Muslims. So the, so the Yehud of Banu Nadir, they had to convince them. And they basically offered them that we will give you half of the produce of Khaybar for one year. For one year. So that is you know, a huge income, right? A huge source of, of, of food supply. So this was kind of enough to convince them. But the Ghatafan, what did they do? They went behind the Banu Nadir and they sent word to Medina, to the Prophet ﷺ, saying that this is what the Jews have offered us. You give us a third of Medina and we won't come fight you. Alright? You give us a third of Medina, we won't come fight you. Now the Prophet ﷺ consulted some companions. Sa'ad bin Mu'ad, Sa'ad bin Ubadah, because these were uh, the Ansari leaders. But they said, Ya Rasulullah, we never surrendered to anyone in the time of Jahiliyyah. How can we then surrender to someone when Allah has honored us with Islam? We're not going to surrender. And the Prophet ﷺ liked that. So basically the Ghatafan were told that no, we don't want to surrender to you. We're not giving you anything. If you want to come fight, come fight. We'll deal with that. So what happened? The Quraysh now, they send delegations to different tribes. All right? Across the region. And the response was very positive. Everyone was willing to help the Quraysh in terms of arms, weapons, horses, warriors, etc. And what happened? Together, 10,000 people came. And you see there's different groups over here. Banu Nadir, Ghatafan, Quraysh of Mecca, and then all these little tribes from all over the area. This is why this battle is known as Ahzab. What does Ahzab mean? Different groups. So all the different groups of Kufr, right, of Shirk, they came together against the Muslims. But remember that because they were Ahzab, there was no single, you know, one leader. Each group came with their own leader. So you see what's going on? It's a huge group of people, but there's no unity here. And we see that this is what caused their defeat eventually. No no unity from the very beginning. Now Abu Sufyan, he was the leader of the largest group. 4,000 people from Mecca came. So he was the leader of the largest group. But, but remember that the Arabs were very proud, right? This is why they didn't want one king. Each tribe had their own leader. 
Because they were, they were too proud to accept one leader. So even at the time of battle, what happened? They're coming together, uniting under the banner of kufr, but still they had no one leader. All right? Abu Sufyan, he was a leader of the majority of the people, you can say, but not everybody. So everyone began gathering in a pre-selected place near Medina, and the plan was to gather there and then together march to Medina. Now when the Prophet ﷺ in Medina, he learned about this, he assembled the Muslims, he consulted them on the matter. Now the Muslims in Medina, maximum you could say there were 2,500 maximum. So 2,500 Muslims versus 10,000 people, how could there be a battle? And previously in the battle of Uhud, we learned that when the Muslims were very eager to go outside and fight, they had learned their lesson, right? That you can't take much risk. It's too dangerous. So now when the Prophet ﷺ is asking them for suggestions, hardly any suggestions came. Because they didn't know what to do. They couldn't come up with many options. Now here, Salman al-Farisi radiallahu anhu, he suggested that a trench be dug. Right? Because he said this is what people do in Persia. So the Prophet ﷺ, he liked that idea. And therefore, the trench was to be dug. All right? And this is the reason why this battle is also known as Ghazwa Khandaq. Right? Because Khandaq is trench. All right. Now, remember that Medina was naturally protected by volcanic rock on the east side and the west side. It's known as Harra Sharqiya and Harra Gharbiya. Now, volcanic rock for miles and miles, it's impossible for an army to walk on it. Right? And it's 10,000 people. Not possible for them to come over the volcanic rock. Alright? So the right side, the left side is blocked. Alright. To the south of Medina were all date palms, orchards. Now even that area, 10,000 people cannot come through. How can you walk through date palms? You understand? And because the army was so huge, their numbers were a problem. Because how, how can you get 10,000 people through date palm trees, or through orchards of date palm trees? Not possible. So the only option they had was to come through the side that was open into Medina. Because 10,000 people had to come in, right? If only a group of them would come in, the Muslims would fight them off. So the plan was 10,000 together come in. So what happened? The idea was that the trench be dug between Harra Sharqiya and Harra Gharbiya. All right? So basically join the two volcanic plains. All right, with the trench. You understand? So basically the north of Medina. On the east, volcanic rock. Left, volcanic rock. South, gardens and gardens of date palms. The only side that is open is north. So the army would only come from there. All right? Now this side, it is said that it was approximately one mile or one kilometer, two kilometers. Some said it was more than that. There's difference of opinion over this. All right. So the exact length and in fact even the location of the trench there is difference of opinion about this. All right. However, wherever that trench was, however long it was, the Muslims agreed to dig the trench and the Prophet ﷺ assigned 10 people, so he divided the people, the Muslims into groups of 10. And a group of 10 people were assigned a portion of about 40 feet, all right, to dig. Now, remember that this trench was approximately two kilometers or so long, right? Or one kilometer. That is also a a pretty long distance, right? And then it had to be wide enough and deep enough, all right? And the point was that the Muslims would stand in front of the trench guarding the city of Medina so that whenever the army would try to cross the trench, they would shoot arrows and basically keep them away. All right. Now, the digging was a very difficult task because they were short in time. They had no machines. They had limited tools, right? limited resources. And the Prophet ﷺ himself participated in the digging of the trench. In Bukhari, we learned that the Prophet ﷺ would say poetry while digging the trench and the Sahaba would respond. And the Sahaba would say poetry and the Prophet ﷺ would respond. So basically they were Encouraging one another, right? And remember when they were building the masjid? Same thing happened, right? Barra radiallahu anhu, he said that I saw the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa on the day of the Battle of Trench carrying earth. He himself was carrying earth, meaning mud. 
till the hair of his chest were covered with dust. And the Prophet ﷺ, I mean, he had uh, hair on his chest, but Barra said that you couldn't even see the hair. Why? Because there was so much mud caked on his abdomen, it was completely covered. And he was carrying dust. All right? And while he was doing that, the Prophet ﷺ, he was saying the poetry of Abdullah bin Rawaha. Allahumma lawla anta mahtadayna, wa la tasaddaqna, wa la sallayna, fa anzilna sakinatan alayna, wa thabbit al-aqdam, in laqayna, in al-a'da'a qad baghaw alayna, idha aradu fitnatan abayna. That, oh Allah, were it not for you, we would not have been guided. Look at these words. At time of difficulty, what do we say? Ya Allah, what's going on here? We need your help. And the Prophet ﷺ is saying, Ya Allah, if it were not for you, we would not have been guided. Nor would we have given in charity. You guided us. You allowed us to give charity. Nor would we have prayed. You allowed us to pray. So they're taking this problem as a favor. Of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Look at how positive Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is. So bestow on us calmness. And when we meet the enemy, then make our feet firm. For indeed, if they want to put us in affliction, meaning if they want to come fight us, then we refuse. Meaning we refuse to flee. We will remain firm and we will fight them. And it is said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he used to raise his voice while reciting the last words of these verses of poetry. And this was not all. Sahal bin Sa'ad al who said that we were with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa in the trench and some people were digging the trench while some people were carrying the mud away. And the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa he said, Allahumma la aisha illa aisha al-akhirah faghfir lil-muhajireen wal-ansar. Oh Allah, there is no life except the life of the hereafter. So forgive the muhajireen and the ansar. In another hadith we learned that when the Prophet ﷺ, he saw the muhajirun, it was cold, they were hungry, all right, early morning, they were tired, they were scared, and they're carrying, you know, mud away, and they're digging. The Prophet ﷺ, he, he felt really bad for them, because as a leader, he felt for them. And the Sahaba, they said, نَحْنُ الَّذِينَ بَايَعُوا مُحَمَّدًا عَلَى الْإِسْلَامِ مَا بَقِينَا أَبَدًا they said, we are those who have given the Pledge of Allegiance to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for Islam as long as we live. You see the, the air of positivity over here? Nobody's complaining, nobody's angry, nobody's whining. There's nothing like that. Everybody's positive. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he heard them saying this, he responded, Allahumma innahu la khayra illa khayru al-akhira fabarik fil ansari wal muhajira. In one version he said, فَغْفِرْ Here he said, بَارِكْ And we see that in less than 10 days, it took about 6 days, and some say about 2 weeks. So around 10 days, the entire trench was dug. Without machines, with limited manpower, limited tools. This is a, this is a miracle indeed. And it shows the determination of the Sahaba. And we learned that while the trench was being dug, there was a shortage of food supplies from the very beginning. Because first of all, this battle was in winter, which means that they're already eating the food that they have saved up. There's no fresh supply from the date palms, right? And secondly, this uh, battle was something that they had not prepared for, right? So they could not replenish their supplies. And now what happened was that from the moment the trench was to be dug, they were busy digging the trench. Everybody was busy. They didn't have time to go outside, buy some food, come back. Nobody had the time. And even if they were to go, they would find the enemy. You understand? So nobody could go outside to buy food. There was a shortage of food supplies from the very beginning, even while the trench was being dug. Javed bin Abdullah, remember Javed Abdullah? He said that we were digging the trench on the day of Khandaq. And we came across a big rock. We couldn't break it. So we went to the Prophet ﷺ. We can't break this rock. He said, okay, I'm coming down. He came in the trench. He said, Bismillah. And he struck the rock. And the rock literally turned into sand. Now, Jabir ﷺ, he said that when I saw the Prophet ﷺ doing that, his shirt, it lifted a little bit. And I saw rocks tied to the stomach of the Prophet ﷺ. This is in Bukhari. 
Why were rocks tied to his stomach? Because he was so hungry that he had tied rocks to his stomach. So Jabir radiallahu anhu, he said, Ya Rasulullah, please allow me to go home. So he went home quickly and he said to his wife, is there anything to eat? Remember his wife? Huh? Is there anything to eat? She said that we just have a little bit of barley and uh, we have a goat. So he said, I slaughtered the goat right away. She ground the barley, she made dough from it and I cooked the meat and as soon as that was done, I went to call the Prophet wasallam. He said, when I was leaving, my wife said, do not disgrace me in front of Allah's messenger. Meaning, don't go call everybody. Just call the Prophet wasallam. So Jabir and who went to the Prophet wasallam quietly and he said, Ya Rasulullah, I have some food. Please come. The Prophet wasallam said, what is it? And he told him what it was. The Prophet wasallam said, it's good. It's enough. And he said, get up, O people of the trench. So there are a thousand people over there digging the trench. Everybody goes home with the Prophet and goes to the house of Jabir. When he reaches his house and a thousand people are coming, the wife of Jabir, she said, may Allah do so and so to you. Right? She said, she's getting angry. I told you to do this secretly. What have you done? So the Prophet when he came in, he said to the companions, enter but do not crowd. Right? Meaning take your food and, and disperse. Don't just sit over here. How can a thousand people fit in the house of Jabir? So, and the Prophet ﷺ called the wife of Jabir, and he basically took the dough, said Bismillah, and then the meat also, and he told his wife that call your friend to help bake the bread. Meaning, don't do this yourself. There is a thousand people. Call call a friend of yours and bake the bread together. And she said, Jabir ﷺ, who said the the bread was baked, the meat was cooked, and the Prophet ﷺ began breaking the bread into pieces. And he would put some meat over it and he would pass it. So he himself was pouring the food and serving his companions. And every single one of those thousand people ate from that food. Jabir said there were one thousand people who ate. And by Allah, they all ate. And when they left the food and went away, our pot was still bubbling, meaning it was still full of meat. It was as if it had not decreased and our dough was still being baked as if nothing of the dough had been used. And the Prophet ﷺ said to the wife of Jabir, eat, meaning eat the food, and also give to others because the people are struck with hunger. She wanted the food only for Rasulullah ﷺ. But the Prophet ﷺ wanted the food for everybody. Never be selfish when it comes to food. Allah will put barakah. And imagine, thousand people ate from this. There were many other miracles that happened which which really showed to the Muslims that the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is there. But the help came when they took the challenge. When they embraced it with you know hope and trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Positive, you know, you can see the positivity in their words, in their actions in their determination, no negative words about Allah, no negative thought about Allah and His Messenger. And the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala came. Inshallah, we will continue with this in our next session. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik, nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta, nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.